Hi, I'm uh, Shoman the Sarkar uh, from Hirat Packard Labs. Um, and uh, I'll be presenting um, um, some of the work that we're doing on quantifying and uh, measuring robustness um, uh, of machine learning models and, refine, and how to refine these models to enhance robustness. Now, uh, machine learning um, models have a peculiar vulnerability where a small perturbation of data may cause a model to misclassify for image classification. Uh, uh, like, you know, uh, such perturbations occur naturally at deployment uh, because of distortions from camera like dust, sensor decay, or fogging. Uh, it can also occur from adversarial attacks. Now, um, also, we were, we were looking at how to measure and quantify robustness. Uh, we anticipate stricter regulations of uh, you know, like machine learning usage, as we are seeing in the EU um, and now in, in the US, we, um, which will require algorithmic audit and measurement of trustworthiness. Uh, now, one of the key limitations on how uh, machine learning models are tested today is the static nature of the tests. We rely mostly on the static data to evaluate the models. Um, as we were looking at this complexity of machine learning models, we thought, uh, why not leverage machine learning to test the trustworthiness of the machine learning uh, models? Now, uh, here, as you can see, uh, like, you know, uh, let's see how it works, right? Uh, so here there is a uh, beer glass, cannot be any clearer um, and uh, sh should not be hard to miss, uh, to, uh, to classify it. Right? As you can see, uh, the distortions, uh, like, you know, is successively added uh, on the bottom left pane um, and the classification probability changes. And soon the machine learning model with a very little distortion that you see being added on the top, uh, on the bottom left, uh, it misclassifies it as a gas station. Uh, so, you know, um, so this is one of the main problem that we are addressing. Uh, now, a robustness for the machine learning model is key for ensuring consistent classification accuracy uh, with uh, variations in input data uh, and is an important element of trustworthiness. Uh, we wanted uh, the agent to work with black box models, uh, which is uh, of advantage as we do not need access to the model code. And also um, it, it needs much less uh, specialized uh, data scientists efforts uh, so that, you know, we can democratize uh, like, you know, measurement of uh, robustness. Now to talk, tackle the complexity of the machine learning models, uh, we used um, uh, some uh, smart machine learning technology called reinforcement learning uh, to evaluate uh, these robustness and to find out the minimum distortion needed for the misclassification. Now, unlike many other adversarial attack techniques of today, uh, we keep these distortions limited to the Gaussian noise to keep it close to the naturally occurring distortions that we see today. Now, um, uh, this will also lower the risk of um, for the users in deploying the underperforming machine learning models uh, to increase the return of investment decrease liability and help in regulatory compliance. Uh, now, this provides a, a, also the quantitative metric for robustness and can also be used for algorithmic audit for trustworthiness. In addition, this technique can help retrain machine learning models to enhance robustness against outliers, as we'll soon see. So how it works is like, you know, here um, we have got a smart agent and um, and as you can see, um, uh, we evaluate uh, like, you know, um, uh, the, so the smart agent add distortions uh, uh, to the images, and then it passes through the image classification model to see like, you know, uh, what is the effect of those distortions. Now, but we are using the smartness of the machine learning agents to, uh, to add uh, the distortions at specific areas uh, which are the vulnerability of the machine learning models. And uh, what we are also um, doing is, uh, as we're analyzing the specific vulnerability of the machine learning models, we are creating new synthetic data, which we call adversarial samples. And these adversarial samples uh, kind of encapsulates the vulnerability. And then we are going um, on the outer loop to retrain the machine learning models so some of those vulnerabilities gets fixed and uh, and uh, the machine learning model becomes much more robust. Uh, this is typically, you know, in, in deployment, what happens is you have 
a lot of unseen data um, um, and test data which are coming in. Uh, and when, whenever we detect some of the vulnerabilities, we generate this adversarial data and we train against those vulnerabilities, which is called adversarial training to fix those robustness issues. Now, let's see what happens like, you know, uh, without retraining uh, the machine learning model. Uh, now here, um, as you can see on the, uh, on the bottom left, uh, there's very little distortion uh, that is needed for uh, the classification flip to occur. Now, after the first retraining, when we had made the um, uh, machine learning model robust enough, uh, now we need uh, more distortions for this uh, cougar to change into the wild cat. And after secondary training, uh, like, you know, we need even more um, uh, distortions to be added uh, for, like, you know, uh, for, for the misclassification to happen. As you see, it's pretty, now, uh, it's pretty resistant to the noise. And then um, the cougar face, which is this class, it stays on for a long time before it uh, switches to the wild cat. Now, if we uh, uh, recapitulate, what we're doing is the original image has no distortion. And then uh, after um, uh, for the untrained model, like we see with a little distortion, we get the flip. Then after we do the first retraining, it needs much more distortion to cause the flip. And then uh, it, it needs even more distortion after the second retraining. Now, this process cannot go on forever, like, you know, uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, but in the initial few retrainings, we see quite a bit of increase of robustness. Now, one thing to note is here uh, we are not changing the model structure. We are not even analyze uh, like you know trying to rearchitect the model structure. We are instead um, I'd say enriching the data which encapsulates the vulnerability of the model and training them uh, for the good. So uh, let's also look at like you know some of the other uh, sort of distortions. So, so the earlier distortions are all based on noise, right? Uh, Gaussian noise, which is naturally occurring noise. But we can also extend this to dead pixels. So if you see, this is a, a picture of a bulbul. Now, um, and if you look at it, there are tiny spots which comes up over here, just like you know the dead pixel in the um, in the image sensors, which cause uh, such um, um, like you know vulnerabilities uh, for the model to flip. Um, also, like you know, uh, we can do blurs, which is a uh, which is a typical effect of blurring on your um, image sensor lens. And as you can see, like you know, there is a tiny blur which appears over here. And if you look at the original image, original image is clear, and this tiny blur at a very, I'd say, vulnerable area of the image can cause it to misclassify. This is another um, uh, like this is a sea anemone, and again. Uh, look, it's similar to human perception. When we look at it, we look at the finer details. And now uh, track, like, you know, the blur is a tiny blur uh, at, at the center, which is like, you know, uh, kind of how, how um, we humans think. So so these are like, you know, some of the, um, uh, like, you know, data augmentation techniques by which you now change the static nature of the test data to like a hacker who dynamically can morph the uh, test data to find out the vulnerabilities to quantify how robust a machine learning model is. And then we are using this adversarial data which we have generated to train the machine learning model to make it more um, robust. Um, now I'll uh, hand it over to my colleague, uh, Liam, um, who is um, uh, like, you know, now um, uh, implementing it uh, in a way this computation scales and uh, HP has got this. Um, um, Hi, everyone. I'm Liam, and I'm excited to show you how you can apply what Shumin Yu do just showed you to, uh, using our open source library called Determined. And Determined is basically a platform that focuses on making model development at scale easy and highly usable for uh, groups and teams of ML developers. So, you know, on day one, uh, if you're a single ML developer, you're working generally with small experiments on single GPUs, and therefore you don't really need a lot of the infrastructure 
that's really useful when you start scaling to more GPUs or when you start requiring um, kind of guarantees around reproducibility and being able to collaborate with your team and so on. So Determine is a platform that focuses on the day two of machine learning development, where you want to have infrastructure that can help you manage multiple GPUs and perform more complicated machine learning workflows like hyperparameter search, uh, and also track all of your experiments so they are reproducible and shareable across your group. Uh, another thing that we help with is distributed training, which is which can be hard to configure and fragile uh, to use, especially if you're starting from scratch in the cloud or on your own on-premises machines. Some of the main features of Determine are kind of shown here, and we'll get to see part a few of these components in the demo. Um, but as I said before, Determine really focuses on the model development portion of the ML development pipeline. We integrate with solutions kind of before and after training. So, you know, we integrate with various data storage solutions like uh, S3 and bucket storage in the cloud. Uh, and, and then we also work well with kind of downstream applications like Selden and MLflow that kind of make serving much easier. But the core of Determine is really focused on training and you can see uh, some of the features that we support here. Um, and I think uh, the, Many of these features help tremendously with usability and being productive, as especially as you start scaling to uh, more GPUs or just larger data sets and so on. So let's see how you can use Determine to use the robust uh, adversarial data generation method that Shunindu presented previously. So here we're looking at the determined web UI and right now I'm using determined to run a cluster on Google Cloud. Um, and you can see there are various uh, buttons over here on the left side that kind of summarize various things that you've done on your cluster. I'm going to go over here in the tasks and open kind of a notebook that I've set up previously to do uh, adversarial example generation. Um, it's this one. So you can see like determine, you can work with notebooks and determine very easily. Um, it's hooked up to a shared file system that we've created in the cloud. And I just have the, the R lab, which is the technique that was presented before. I have a demo up here to kind of show how you can very easily use this just in a notebook. So doing a bunch of imports over here uh, and configuring how we want to generate the data. Uh, next, I'm just going to create the data loader and also the classifier that we're going to attack with this with the method. So now we can see the classifier has been loaded. We have the data. Uh, we're going to get one data example here and then ask our lab to basically generate the adversarial image iteratively by successively adding natural noise, as we saw in the presentation. So uh, it looks like in this case, we finished very quickly in just three iterations. So um, I'm guessing this image was not particularly robust. Um, so this is the CIFAR 10 data set. So uh, unfortunately, the resolution here is pretty low, so 32 by 32. But as you can see from the result, we start with an airplane. And by adding a small amount of noise just in the corner there, it suddenly flipped the prediction from airplane to frog. Uh, so a notebook is all nice and good when you just want to interact with your data and maybe get a feel for how a an adversarial attack performs. But once you're at a stage where you want to apply adversarial generation to a large data set that can be difficult to scale if you don't have kind of the, the machinery and set up to provision GPUs and uh, schedule multiple um, GPUs to run generation for you. And that is kind of where Determine can help a lot with the workflow. So, um, so I have an example here that basically runs that exact uh, process that we just went through in the notebook, but now I can throw as many GPUs at the uh, at the problem as I want. So this is kind of uh, very similar things that we looked at in the notebook. I uh, have a function to help us visualize the results that will be out 
put it to TensorBoard. Um, and as you can see here, it's very similar, load the data, get the classifier and loop through the data, data loader now to generate all of the examples. Uh, with Determine, scaling from just one GPU to multiple GPUs is as easy as changing a single line in, in an experiment config. So if we start with the single GPU example, have hyperparameters that kind of control how the images are generated. And as part of the resources, I'm, I'm telling Determine that I want to use one GPU here. Uh, and if we look at a multi GPU configuration, everything is the same, except I just changed the slots per trial under resources to four or whatever number you want to use. Um, so with that configuration, I can now create an experiment uh, in determined. Um, so I'll launch both a single GPU and a multi GPU experiment. And we can come back to the web UI to see uh, what's happening on the experiment end. So I've created a workspace and a project to kind of aggregate all these experiments together since they're related. And I want to be able to see all the experiments I've run relative, related to this um, question uh, in one place. So the two experiments we just created show up here in the web UI. And if we look at um, this current experiment, it, nothing is being generated because in the background, we're actually provisioning instances in Google Cloud for you. So this is why this hasn't gotten started yet. And similar thing is happening with the multi GPU experiment. But I do have a few experiments that I kicked off a little bit before that we can look at to see kind of what the model development process looks like with, with Determined. So um, let's look at this completed one. Uh, so this is the multi GPU experiment. And uh, you can see like I've registered basically the average L2 distance that quantifies model robustness to this kind of Gaussian noise. Um, that's all being kind of tracked over here as part of the experiment overview and can see uh, the robustness of the model for the Sephar 10 test data set is around um, an average L2 distance of 2.2 that's needed to basically flip a class label. Um, so this is all being tracked and determined. You can see this. Um, you can see the hyperparameters that were being used. The logs also show up uh, in this panel here. Uh, and you can filter by rank since we used four GPUs here. You can see, you know, you can basically filter to the logs that are being generated by each individual GPU. Um, and we can also open up a tensor board to look at uh, the various um, images that were being generated as part of the adversarial attack process. So Right now, the tensor board is spinning up and it's copying data from uh, Google's cloud bucket where we basically persisted the tensor board events automatically for you. So um, I know we might have generated, I might have generated quite a few images. So that's probably why this is taking so long. Um, but we can come back to this in a little bit. Uh, let's take a look now at what's going on with the other experiments that we submitted. So we can see uh, now the cluster usage is higher because we've spun up additional GPUs. And right now we're just setting up and launching the individual processes to generate the examples. Um, yeah, so let's wait a little bit more for this tensor board. And see the okay. So we're scheduling a tensorboard. That's why um, we're spinning up a CPU instance to handle the request of basically um, like base, handle the request to render the tensorboard events and uh, spin up the tensorboard service. So the tensorboard service is finally up in one of our CPU instances, and you can see uh, with determine we're actually also automatically saving a bunch of uh, the, basically the same time series, but in a more granular um, fashion to TensorBoard. I've also outputted images periodically so that we can see um, what the original versus adversarial examples look like. So you can see they're we're basically spitting out these 
uh, images for visual expect inspection and fixed intervals. Um, and yeah, you know, oh, this one. So this one we can see was actually uh, fairly hard to flip because we had to add a lot of noise in the in a, like so much so that it's like visually noticeable with the human eye. Um, this one, not so much, as you can see, like going from automobile to truck and intuitively those two are much closer. So we didn't have to add as much noise to, to flip the label. Um, so I think the, you know, that's the TensorBoard integration with our product is also very useful uh, to help you track the examples as you generate them. So now the examples that I'm generating are all being saved into shared storage. Um, so this is one of the folders with the adversarial examples. And uh, for retraining, we can basically point the model retraining code uh, to this shared file system to train with adversarial examples. And again, take advantage of things like distributed training to speed up that process as well. Uh, so that concludes my demo. If you're interested in learning more about our product, as I said, it's fully open source. So you can go check us out on GitHub and, and get started locally with, the, with your local cluster um, to, to see just whether it would help you with the, with the day-to-day -day work that you're doing in machine learning. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And it's a pleasure to be here at the Data-Centric AI Summit.